they've assured me that the tent is not going to fall down on us, so we'll just deal with the rest. Um, so these are some content notes. I wanted to let you know that we're going to touch on these subjects. We're not going to go into any depth in them, but if they're problematic for you, I don't want you to be uh, startled. All right, so let's talk about my clicker. There we go. Let's talk about the depth of data. When I first started proposing this talk, um, it was this long, elaborate thing about how we've become hoarders. But as this talk has evolved, I figured out that what I really want to say is two things. One, you're keeping too much data. And two, you're not thinking about when to get rid of it. So with that in mind, that's the, the very highest level overview. Let's get into this. We start with our friend Ergot. Who here knows what Ergot is? Like, OK, Sam, my one nerd. Uh, no, there's somebody back there, too. Good deal. Ergot is a fungus that grows on grain, especially rye. And when you eat that fungus and that rye or flour or bread that's made from it, you get some really interesting effects. And by interesting, I mean all your limbs feel like they're on fire because you're developing gangrene. And also, you have uh, hallucinations and other painful psychotropic events. And we're pretty sure that ergot was the root cause of what happened in the witch hunts at Salem. It was the root cause of some really uh, appalling witch hunts in uh, France, because this black grain has ergot, and the, the rest are clean. But nobody knew that that was like a problem. They just like, oh, sometimes it comes black. Let's grind it up and eat it. So ergot has the same effect on our systems as bad data has on machine learning systems. The same thing that causes ergot to get into our food stream causes bad data to get into our machine learning streams. Mixed origins and indiscriminate consumption. This is one day's photos from Flickr printed out. Um, this is not the whole room, but that's, that's what it's like. We have become data hoarders. We don't like to get rid of data, and the cheaper storage has gotten, the less invested we are in ever throwing anything away. In a longer talk, I make people take out their phones and delete photos off their phones. So you can just count your, your blessings. This is a short one. Um, data storage is so ridiculously cheap, it is more cost effective to store things you don't need than it is to sort what you put into storage. That's a real inversion from, like I don't know, the rest of history, where there was some friction to storing things. Amazon Glacier is the cryogenics of data. You don't know that you're going to need that, but you might need that. And so you put it in cold storage, and you say, it's relatively cheap to store. I, I might need it, I might not. I'll defrost the head when I get there, right? But it turns out, if you're willing to put up with a delay, you can get your backup back, but not your backup. We say backup, we don't mean backup. We mean indiscriminate data dump. Because again, we haven't taken the time to sort this stuff out. We've just dumped it all in there. So it costs far too much time, energy, and human power to figure out what's going to be useful later. We're just going to keep it all. Good times. I have friends who are archivists. They treasure things like continuous runs of our X-Men comics and microfiches of newspaper files. But they do not want your 14 years of ratty, out-of-order National Geographics. They don't want your utility bills, and they don't want warranty cards for appliances that you've already recycled. These things are not archival level material. So I, I made a quick list of things that you should think about keeping, um, like fiduciary data. There are rules about that. You need to keep that for a certain amount of time. Uh, you should keep old ads forever, because I love old advertising. Um, that's, that's for me. Uh, you should keep data that shows a trajectory, like over time, which direction are you going. And you should keep data that you have specifically told your people that you want to retain. Right? Here's what we shouldn't keep. Meeting invitations. How many of you archive your meeting invitations instead of deleting them? Just because archive is the easiest, right? Uh, data that you don't want to see in the courtroom in, the, in 40 years, R.J. Reynolds and everybody else who ends up hauled into court over their archives. Expired logging data, notifications that have passed their notification window, 
ugly, duplicated, or unlabeled pictures. Unlabeled pictures are of interest to exactly zero people. But because it's hard to label and easy to take and store, we just have these vast archives that our children will hate us for. So what does this have to do with ERGOT? What are the things we're doing with our stored data is constructing giant databases that we feed into machine learning. How many of you signed up for credit monitoring systems? Yeah? About once a week, I get a ping about what's going on with my credit card. And uh, once in a while, I get a call from my credit union who says, are you actually in Tel Aviv? And I'll say, as it happens, I am actually in Tel Aviv. Awesome. And they're like, OK, good. We're just checking, because you live in Minneapolis. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I travel a lot. They've gotten less twitchy about it. If I get like hacked, I'm in big trouble, because they're like, well, yeah, she travels a lot. Uh, that is machine learning and predictive analysis working correctly. But what happens when we feed machine learning bad data, really bad data, like data that gives it hallucinations? Then you get two-year-olds on the no-fly list, and you get people who can't get a job because they share a name with a known felon, and you get all sorts of things that are predictive and analytically sound and still dead wrong. Your credit score determines your employability. Your shopping history reveals your medical diagnosis. That's not like a Gattaca level, the future is scary. That is things that, is ha that are happening right now. And I want you to think about the fact that you are part of making this happen right now. You are working for companies that are collating, collecting, and analyzing this data. This is on you. We're feeding our machine minds data of unknown quality and causing them to hallucinate. Not like little Bobby drop tables hallucination. I'm talking about this moment that I had when I went to apply for a job a couple years ago. And it said, hey, we already have that email address in, your syst in the system. And I said, you do? Well, I retrieve my password, and it turns out they do. 12 years ago, I had applied for a job at the same place, not the same company, but uh, two companies had ingested the company that I had applied for, and they kept my data the whole time, company through company, my address, my name, my salary information, and only because I am a stubborn so-and-so, not my uh, social security number. Like, what were they doing with it? Why were they keeping it that long? What possible use did it have to them? It didn't, but it was expensive to throw it away. Machine learning is not neutral. If you watch one talk out of this conference, it should not be mine. It should be Karina Zona's Consequences of an Insightful Algorithm, where she talks about the ethical consequences of predictive behavior and machine learning. It's amazing. For a tangible example of machine learning hallucinations, think about policing. If after the Wall Street crash of 2008, we had actually arrested all the bankers who caused the crash, and uh, we had locked them up, and then we would look at machine learning and it would say, hey, there are a bunch of arrests in this neighborhood. And the zip code would devalue because the property values would go down. There's a lot of crime in that neighborhood. It's a dangerous part of town. Young white men in extremely sharp suits would be frisked on the street to find out if they were carrying any financial papers. Uh, people on parole would reoffend. They would get parking tickets on Wall Street. All of these things would happen, and it, would, it seems ridiculous. Like, we're not going to stop bankers. We didn't even put them in jail. But that same predictive, like, what are these people doing out kind of feeling is what we're doing now. But we're not doing it to young white men in sharp suits. We're doing it to young black men who happen to live in a neighborhood. We're predicting based on bad data, data that is not causal, it's just correlated. I promised you the death of data, and here it is. I want you to throw data away. I want you to delete it. I want you to obsolesce it, date it like milk, and toss it when it goes bad. Hold on a minute, you say. I could use that data. I can run some analytics on it. I can get a whole bunch of like profile information out of you. Sure, some of that data is useful. But archives are not backups. And this is a thing that people mess up all the time. 
the easiest start to understanding this is by looking at your data retention policy. Who's read your data retention policy? Who has a data retention policy? Right, the only people who are super good about having data retention policies are companies that have either been hauled into court or reasonably expect they will be hauled into court. Everybody else has put this off as something that they need to work on later. Like, it's on the list somewhere. It's in the archives. So we never think about what it is we're archiving, what it is we're deliberately storing. We just do dumps of backups that we then sometimes fail to check to see if they're actually even useful backups. So disambiguate archives and backup and think about what it is you want to be doing with this data in the future. Because what you have right now is the grain and the chaff and the straw. It's undifferentiated. You can't tell what's good, bad, useful, or indifferent. It's all just in one big silo. And you can pay people to mine information out of this. You can say, hey, I have this giant chunk of data. Could you get something out of that for me? Um, you can shine a light on that dark data. Dark data is a longer talk. Um, you can roughly sort it, get rid of like the obviously bad data, unuseful stuff. Um, or you could just get rid of it all and do a better job archiving going forward. Because it's almost free to store it. But then you have to retrieve it. And you have to keep it updated to new formats. And you have to re-index it so you can find it using your new analytics tool. And retrieval's not cheap, because if retrieval were cheap, we would not have companies that spend like millions of dollars on e-discovery going through your old files to find things that you know you put somewhere. So is it really a sale if you didn't intend to buy it? And is it really cheap if you're not using it? We store all sorts of stupid data. There are some kinds that are unrepeatable and should be stored, in a, especially in their raw format. Seismic soundings, medical studies, accident data, things like that. If you can't repeat it and you can use it, storing it is great. But there are also huge categories of things that are repeatable or meaningless, like how many passengers went through a turnstile or the spelling words that a now graduated student missed. I assure you that somewhere on an archive somewhere are all of your old student records. And what good does that do anyone? Like, that's useless. The important thing to remember about data is that it's not neutral. It is sitting there being a threat surface. Every piece of data you have is another piece of exposure to both bad actors and bad feelings. Because here's the thing, this looks like a kitty tummy that you could pet. I assure you that cat will come up and, and hug your arm with all of its claws. But exposure is not just about security vulnerabilities. It's about emotional damage to the humans on the other side of the screen. I have two children, and I've been pregnant five times. When I had a miscarriage, it was late enough that I had gone to Amazon and started a baby list. And that triggered all of the trackers in the world to know that I was pregnant. And if you can get a mother's loyalty while she's pregnant, she will persist in using those brands for the entirety of the kid's childhood. Like, till they're 18, she will persist in these brands. Pregnant mothers are like gold. But then I wasn't pregnant anymore. And I deleted that Amazon account because I couldn't convince it. I didn't want to look at onesies. And I had to take my machine down to bare metal because there were hidden trackers so far down that even I, as a relatively technical person, couldn't find them. Nobody thought about that use case when they collected the data. But I suffered for it, and I resented every one of those bastards who made me think about it again. Profiling is about people, people as wholes, not just an assemblage of their data points. We keep making these constellations in our head where we have all of these stars that we think are data points and we're like, oh, I see Orion. No, you see a bunch of data points that you are imagining a person onto. So when you are collecting data about this, about us, remember that that's really important. 
we have feelings about getting rid of data. We go through anger, bargaining, and denial about trying to cope with losing data, especially if you didn't intend to lose data. You, you have that feeling. Anybody ever lost like a week's work? Anger, bargaining, and denial. I once lost a month to a bad backup. I was pretty pissed. To kill data is to acknowledge the loss of its potential. We don't know what we would do with data, so we imagine that it's infinitely potential. It's like unobtainium. We don't know how valuable it is, so we can't possibly get rid of it. It's immensely valuable. It is. It quite literally powers the internet. Without cookies and tracking, our ads wouldn't be tuned, and they'd be worth much less. And since the open web is predicated on free access for now, someone has to pay for all the servers and pipes and switches and cables. And for all of us sitting here, the way most of that happens is through ad revenue and through the cussedness of some floss people who just can't give up. So the compensation for us using the free internet is giving up our personal data. If you know my demographic, you know how I'm likely to vote. If you know I was shopping for something, you can make that something follow me around to all sorts of different websites until I crack and buy it. Craftsy is really good at this. They're like, you looked at a class. Would you like to buy a class? I could sell you a class. I usually buy it. I'm, I'm very weak about Craftsy classes. And so that's the exchange as it currently stands. You can follow me. You can sell me things that I might actually want as opposed to like power boats. But if the data we use is bad or poorly sorted, we're wasting our time and our ad buys, and we are certainly hurting some people. Who here has had this experience? You buy something from Amazon, and then for like two weeks, you get tracked by that thing, and you're like, I bought it. Like, we're good. I'm wearing it. No? OK. So my best example of the way that we live with poison data that we should get rid of is BMI, body mass index. This person is clinically obese. His doctor should not allow him to have surgeries until he loses weight, uh, and he should definitely be counseled to go on a diet. This person's fine. No worries. Which of those people do you think is actually healthier? Because I'm not voting on the white guy. Because body mass index is encoded in our actuarial tables, it's encoded in our fitness apps. And then it's encoded in our healthcare system, but it's all still poisonous. It's based on a formula conceived 200 years ago by a Belgian mathematician who was working with white male upper class Belgians who had the time to sit around and get measured. And uh, it's also compiled from actuarial tables uh, from the US census uh, in 1912 and 1949. As you know, those were really peak healthy times for American males. Uh, the average lifespan for men in 1912 was 50. Go team. Um, so we were describing the average weight of these men, these men who had had poor nutrition and world wars and starvation and could also afford life insurance. There's a lot of factors in there that we're not really acknowledging. But as the years wore on, normal weight, the average weight for a man, changed into standard weight, which morphed into ideal weight through ways that we can't really determine. And then Ansel Keys, who was a super fascinating guy and also did a study on why dieting makes you literally insane, did a study on refeeding the Europeans after World War II. And he said, BMI can be applied across populations. It's useful that way. We can look at broad populations using BMI more or less. And he said explicitly in the paper where he wrote this, I went and dug it out, he said, it should never, ever be used for individual diagnosis because it cannot distinguish between weight and fatness. It can't tell muscle from fat or bone. And so the man who, who sort of ended up being who people pointed at when they codified this into our systems said it was a terrible idea. And yet, we love easy answers. We love them. They're so entrancing. Look, there's a simple formula. Just multiply a couple things, and, and we'll go ahead and apply it to children. 
and to people who aren't white and to pregnant women. And we will change how their doctors treat them based on this arbitrary number. And we will say, if you have knee problems, you need to lose weight before you can get surgery. But what if you have knee problems and therefore you can't do the exercise that allows you to lose weight? Too bad, sorry, your BMI has to be below this number arbitrarily. Maybe you could like cut off half a leg or something. I, I don't care, as long as the number's right. Uh, this is actually a, an enormous problem with Medicare. If you have an amputee, it really throws the BMI numbers off. And it turns out that BMI is not a great health indicator. People with a BMI of over 30 survive cancer and surgery better than people who have a healthy weight or are underweight. But does knowing that really matter when your watch is judging you for being chubby? And does it matter when your doctor can't do necessary surgery because the uh, HMO says you, you are a risk? It doesn't. We created this monster. We coded it into all of our systems. And I honestly don't see how we're going to dig it out of all the machines that believe in it. We are stuck with this poison. But I don't think we're stuck with all of the poisons. Old data is not neutral dark matter sitting there doing nothing. Old data is the dead hand of history, and it reaches out and infects current data. It reaches out and says, this data should come into the old way of thinking. The old way of thinking should affect this data. We're symbiotic with big data at this point because that BMI rant, it applies to standardized testing in schools, racially biased search algorithms, and incarceration rates. What we feed our machine determines the machine's output. And feeding it poison gets us a poisoned society because we are not rugged individuals. We are symbiotic with big data. We have woven it into our very lifestyles and we have not thought about that problem. So here's what you can do. Hire an archivist. There are a lot of librarians out there who will show up for your sweet, sweet private sector money, and they have been trained in something that they call deacquisition, which is a nice way of saying throwing shit away. And they will train you in deacquisition and throwing shit away because they have a much better idea of how to calibrate whether or not you should keep some information. They have classes in this sort of thing. Constrained storage space. It's an artificial constraint. I used to be super annoyed when my uh, Outlook folder would get full and IT would come and nag me and they'd be like, you should maybe get rid of some of that stuff. And I'd be like, but it's my stuff. No, constrain it. Like, you should maybe get rid of some of that stuff. You should put it in a wiki so other people can find it. You should do something, anything other than leaving it in your inbox indefinitely. You should train data retention. You should train people in what they're supposed to keep because then they can tell what's good and what's not. They can understand what it is that you want and therefore they can reject what it is that you don't want. And you should automate deletion. We get all up in our feelings about getting rid of things. This is why mini storage is such a booming business in America. We have too many feelings about getting rid of stuff. So we have reasonable emotions like fear and anxiety about deleting stuff. But if we just automate deletion, if we just age stuff out automatically, nobody gets in their feelings about that other than the first time. It's just like, oh, if you even notice it's gone, it was old and it didn't matter. And so you're much less emotionally involved. So I really hope that if this was too long and you read Twitter, you take away these three points. Collect data carefully. Ingest data mindfully. Delete boldly. If you have to do a provisional delete and see if anybody whines about it being gone, but mostly just delete it. You can probably replace it. Thank you all and fill out your forms because I'll come read them.